this might be the only video you need to watch on using Mainstage 3. Today, I'm gonna to take you from complete beginner to expert in about 50 minutes. We're gonna make a concert together, starting from this and ending up at this, with a drone generator and loads of useful features. We're not gonna miss any details, but at the same time, it's gonna be low on waffle. So let's get straight into it. But I should say, if you don't fancy sitting around for 50 minutes and watching me make this thing, then you can download it from a link in the description. So everyone's a winner. But I should say, the learning how to do this yourself is actually way more useful than me just handing it to you. So I would recommend watching the whole video and also it's YouTube, so I'm contractually obliged to say that. Anyway, let's crack on. Part one, let's make a basic concept. So the first thing you want to do is go into file and press new. This will bring up this menu, which will bring up a load of options for different types of main stage concert that you can create. It's quite a range of choices available, but we're just gonna pick keyboard minimalist as this is the simplest to start with. Before you go any further, just make sure you've got your MIDI keyboard connected up to your laptop via USB cable. Otherwise, a lot of the stuff I'm about to show you won't work. I'm just going to hit the red record button so I can record audio for this video. This isn't something you'll have to do, but I'm just telling you so you know what's going on. So now we're going to make sure that our keyboard is assigned. Essentially, this just means that main stage and the keyboard can talk to each other. So we just press a sign and press a note on our keyboard and we should see that the MIDI port option should now show the name of our keyboard or whatever it is for yours. So the next thing to set is the number of keys. My keyboard is 88 keys, so I'm just going to set that. And I'm also just going to name it Hammer 88. You'll also want to set the lowest key. Press learn and then press the lowest key on your keyboard and it will assign it automatically. So just to show you it's working, I'll just play something. So we're in business. Main stage and the keyboard are talking with each other, which is great. But there's a few other things we'll need to assign on the keyboard, which are fairly fundamental. So make sure your sustain pedal is plugged in and press assign. And then press your sustain pedal down. And this will allow your sustain pedal to communicate with main stage. So you can see for me, it all looks good. There's another two controls on your keyboard that are fairly crucial. These are the mod wheel and the pitch bend. So we'll just assign those as well in a similar fashion by pressing assign and then moving them on the actual controller itself. So that all looks good to me. So I'll just play again. And I might just check out the pitch bend. Yeah, it's working. So the next thing I'm going to do is something that you should always do when you open a new main stage template, and that is to delete these bus sends that it automatically puts in for you. So navigate to the concert level with me, and you can see that they exist here. So the reason I'm so keen to delete them is because they use this plugin called Space Designer, which is really draining on your computer CPU. So if we just select all these auxiliary buses or reverb sends and just hit delete, we're all done. And then for good measure, we can just remove the bus sends on the electric piano patch. And at this point, it's usually a really good idea to save your main stage concert because you've made quite a few significant changes at this point. So if we head up to file and press save as, it will bring up this menu. And I'm just going to save it in the concerts folder and I'm going to call it tutorial. Then hit save and we'll continue learning about main stage. Another useful tip, if you press command C and then press command V, you can copy and paste and create a copy of the patch. So now hit layout in the top left hand corner and we're going to move into the actual design phase for our main stage template. The first thing I like to turn off is display keyboard layers. I find for me, they kind of ruin the aesthetic of the main stage template, but also, and perhaps more importantly, they actually take up space on screen that you can use for other things. Now I'm just gonna make this patch list a bit less excessive. I mean, we don't need to display 30 different songs. So what I'm going to do is just make it about 10 and I'm going to drag at the corner of the box and just make it a bit smaller. I'll probably change my mind about this later, but this placement's definitely a lot better than what we had at the start. I'm going to delete the set buttons. These are just for navigating between sets. 
You might need, want to include these, but for me, I'm just going to make something that allows me to change patch. So if we just move them around just to make it look a bit better, generally speaking, I'm including all of these details just because for someone who's never used Mainstage before, it's important to see every step along the way. I'm just going to delete the text at the bottom that says patch as well. So that's a bit more economical in terms of design. Speaking of being economical, that's the general philosophy we're going for here. I'm trying to make sure that when I'm putting these things on screen, they're not, they're not taking up an excessive amount of space. So my next thing that I'm going to try and do is make the piano as small as possible. Well, within reason, of course. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag it and try and get it to the bottom left hand corner. Mainstage can be a little bit weird at times in terms of the way different objects behave, even interact with one another. But I generally find if you just persevere enough, you can get it to do what you want it to do. So if we drag it down and try and aim for the bottom left hand corner. I'm also going to move the sustain pedal as well. And if we move the bottom line up, we can make the keyboard shorter, which is going to really help us in achieving our goal. And similarly, I'm going to shrink it in the horizontal direction as well. And now I'm just going to drag it into place. I'm also going to make the mod wheel and the pitch bend controls a bit smaller as well. This is just kind of an aesthetic thing. I'm just trying to make them align nicely with the keyboard by moving the crosshairs at the edge of them. So if I just select all parts of the keyboard, then I can move them to the bottom left. Now I'm going to move the sustain pedal along. But actually I don't want the foot switch and sustain pedal. So what I'm going to do is go down to the menu below and just find the individual sustain pedal object. You might also have a foot switch, but I don't. So I'm just going to do it for sustain pedal today. So I'm just going to make this nice and small as well. And if you remember back to the start of the video, we'll need to assign it again. So you can see how the settings on the sustain pedal just changed. So we've reassigned our sustain pedal and everything seems to be working as it should. I'm just going to do some more cosmetic things. I'm just going to delete these title things. So that's better so it gives us a bit more space. So it's becoming more and more of a canvas for us to create on now rather than just being something we've been given to work with. So in the next stage in the design we're going to create the knobs and faders and sliders and all these sort of things that will allow us to control the different keyboard parameters. I'm just using a Korg Nano Control 2 to do this, but you might have a hardware keyboard that has faders and knobs already on it, so you can just apply the concepts I'm about to show to your keyboard. So the first control I'm looking for is the vertical fader. But while I'm on, I'm just going to adjust the patch list a bit. I'm going to turn it to... Yeah, I'll just leave it on patches and sets. You can see there's a few options that might suit your taste. And we're going to reduce the number of items as well. You can also change the colour as well. I quite like light blue, so I'm going to stick with this as the colour for most of the objects. And you can also change the title up top as well. I'm now going to move this bit to the top right because I've just realised I want to use the bottom left hand space for all these faders and controls. So I'm quite happy now with the positioning of this. So I think we'll crack on. Onto the faders now. I'm just going to pop it over here and hit assign. And then I'm going to move one of the faders on my Korg Nano Control 2. And similar to before, it should assign. And I'm going to change the color. I'm now just going to make the fader nice and narrow. 
This is because I want to get eight of these on and still give myself enough space to put other things in the template later. I'm now going to create a background. This is kind of a cosmetic thing, but it will probably help us when we're playing just so we can see where the different controls are grouped. So if we just pop the background behind the faders and drag it out a bit, I'll inevitably make quite a few changes as we go, but I'm just talking through what I'm doing. I'm dragging the fader over a bit. If you want to stick buttons on for other things, like either left or right of the faders, you might want to do this, but I'm probably not going to do this. So I think that I'll probably end up making this smaller eventually. That might be something for a subsequent tutorial. So you can see I'm making the box quite small. I'm just going to try and stick two faders together. I'm positioning the faders in the bottom left hand corner. You can also then add a knob. This mimics what's on the Nano Control 2. And just positioning the knob and changing the color of it. To assign it, we press the assign like we've done before and move the physical controller itself. So now I'm just going to reassign the controllers just to make sure it's all working. You'll notice that the number has changed from 24 to 25 when I assign the second hardware fader. The reason for this is because when I copied the first fader, it kept the assignment. So now the fader should be assigned to fader one and fader two on my hardware like nano control two. So if you move the first knob on our hardware controller, you'll notice I made a mistake. And this is because you can see that the second knob also moved, but that's because they still have the same assignment because I copied them, which is the thing I was just saying about with the faders. So I just need to address that. I'm also just fixing some of the cosmetic issues as we go. You might have noticed that the parameter values were overlapping with the faders. So I want to try and avoid this so it's possible to see what the controller is saying when I'm playing live. The way I'm doing this is just by making the actual box with these faders in a bit bigger and just moving them around. Sometimes, as I said earlier, mainstays can be a bit fiddly with this stuff, but you just kind of have to be a bit creative and persevere with it. And just double checking the assignment, I'm going to assign the second knob and you can see now it's changed to knob two. This is really crucial to make sure that you've actually got the correct assignments. When you're trying to do, I don't know, 20 or different controls, it's very easy to have the fader on your hardware not mapped correctly. So you move it and it does something unexpected on the screen. I've just selected all the controls and what I've done is I've just grouped them. And this allows me to move it around just like the way I've shown you just. And this is really useful because then we can just do copy paste. I sped the video up a lot and just repeated the procedures I've just spoke about. So I'm just assigning a load of stuff. So you can see they all have different assignments, the faders 24 through to 31, and all the knobs are different as well in terms of their assignments. So you can see it goes from 16 to 23 in terms of like the MIDI CC values, which we won't get into that, but effectively they all have a unique assignment. The first thing we're going to do is just assign one of the faders. You can see me doing it here to the volume of the classic electric piano. So you just click map parameter and click on the volume fader for the classic electric piano. And you should see like on screen that you can control the volume with the fader. You can just see me doing it right now. So the last thing I'm going to show you how to do is to use a knob to control a parameter. So the parameter I'm going to control is the cutoff for an EQ 
effect on this electric piano. So what it will do is it will make the sound a lot more mellow. And this is something that we could control in real time using the hardware knob to control the software. So we just hit map parameter and then click on the parameter. And what I'm going to do is set the range minimum to be about 300 hertz. So you can see the filters down right now. And as I play, it's a lot more mellow. So the last thing I'm going to do is just add a title for the concert. So I'm just going to find the text object. And I'm going to move it to the top left hand corner. I'm just going to call it tutorial template. And if we select the text and then we press font, we can make it a lot bigger. Obviously not 288, but you might want that, I don't know. But um, just make it as a suitable size for your template. And then drag it to wherever you want. Part two, let's make a drone generator so we can switch keys easily when we're playing live. First things first, I'm going to load up a really generic shimmery pad sound. This is one from a collection I made, which you can download from this video. Shameless plug, I know. Anyway, let's crack on. So let's go to the concert level and we'll copy and paste to the concert level. Just ignore this message. It's just a warning to let you know what you're doing. That you actually are copying something to the concert level. And we can just check that we can hear it and all good. Then if we navigate to the MIDI input and we select keyboard none. This is really important, as we'll see later. Now I'm just going to do a bit of an audio routing. I'm now going to create an auxiliary bus at the concert level and then send the drone audio through this. So if you go auxiliary and press create and we're in business. Now we just need to do the audio routing. So I'm going to go bus seven. and I'm going to send the patch, sorry, the channel strip that's called Shimmer, and I'm gonna connect that to Auxiliary 7 and rename Auxiliary 7 to be Drone. So we've called that Drone Bus now, and I'm going to select Drone Bus for the output of the Shimmer Pad patch. I'm just gonna switch back to keyboard keys just to check that the audio is going where it should be and you can see it is because the audio from the shimmer is going to the drone bus and so we're all good. So that's a bit of a whistle stop tour of audio routing in main stage. But that's not why we're here. So if you come with me to up here and we go to the scripter and we're going to load in the worship drone or drone script. This is available via a link in the description. And if we press run script just a few times just to make sure then we're well on our way to having our drone now if we go to the layout button up top and we move into layout mode then we're going to create the architecture in the main stage layout region such that we can really trigger drones of different keys essentially so i'm going to create a background and i'm going to make a nice panel i'm going to change it to this glossy black color and I'm going to drag it out and make it a bit bigger. And now I'm going to create a load of buttons essentially that will enable me to send MIDI notes to the drone pad generator which we're trying to build. And this is really where things start to get going. So you can kind of imagine we're going to have one for each key essentially. So we're going to have 12 buttons C through to B. So now I'm creating the buttons. I drag the first button in from the bottom on the panel controls section, and now I'm just using copy and paste to create the remaining buttons. I'll probably just do a few for now, and we'll come back and do the rest later, just so we can test the core functionality is working before we move on. Main stage layout mode can be a bit annoying if you noticed me in the previous video struggling at different points. So just persist with it and eventually it will work. I think is the best way to say it. So now I'm going to select MIDI port 10. To be honest, it doesn't really matter which one we pick. The main thing to make sure is just that the note is what you want it to be essentially. So the first one I'm going to set to be C, second one I'm going to set to C sharp, and then D and so on and so forth. I like to just make the MIDI port logic remote though. This is just for my own sanity really. 
Now I'm going to drag a text box in and I'm going to unclick show frame around the text. So now I'm going to give each button a key and that's going to match the note which we assigned just a second ago. And positioning a bit nicer than before. Copying and pasting and dragging in line. And now we're going to make this one C sharp, as you might imagine. So let's do it again and we'll call this one D of course. Now I'm going to go down to the bottom and I'm going to drag a button and I'm going to place it underneath. This is really crucial as this will be the control that allows us to turn the drone on and off. Without this, none of it will work essentially. And I'm not really going to bother to change the MIDI port assignment for this one as it doesn't really matter. do a bit of cosmetic stuff as ever. This is really so we can leave ourselves space a bit later on so we can put the other buttons in for the remaining keys that we've not done now. If I copy another text box and I'm going to call this state, this will be the state of the drone essentially and just give us an indicator visually of whether it's on or off. In the appearance section I'm going to leave the colour to be yellow such that we can really see when the drone is active and when it's not. So let's go back to edit mode. If we select the state button, now we're going to map this such that it can turn the drone on and off. So if we go to drone and we go to scripter and we go to drone trigger, then we've just mapped the correct functionality. Now, if we go to the drone fader down here and we map the volume of the drone bus to this, then we'll be able to control the volume of the drone, which is really useful obviously for live performance. So you can see I'm just setting the maximum value to be zero. And so I can move the fader. And then if we hit state, that turns the drone on. And we can use the fader to control the volume of the drone. And if we want to turn the drone off, we can just press state again. And it fades out quite naturally. If you come over to here in the drone bus and press this circle, we'll make the drone bus stereo, which is really something I should have done at the start. So now I'm going to select the level meter next to the drone bus and I'm going to map this to the level parameter essentially. So I'm going to go to drone bus which is number 8 and I'm going to press level and now when I control the volume with a fader you can see the level meter next to the drone bus responds appropriately. So just turning the drone off and back on. So now I'm going to play around with some of the different drone types in this script just to kind of show you what different sounds you can create. So this is essentially the first and the fifth note. This is the first, the fifth, and then the octave above. And then, you know, first octave, fifth above that second octave, and then another octave. So you can just generate some different sounds and it kind of just determines how much frequency content you're going to have. Just to kind of prove it's working outside of the concert level, I've just made a silly patch and I'm just going to turn the drone on. And you can see that the drone stays there infinitely and I can play anything I want. However, there is a problem with this and that is the drone is only playing one particular drone right now. We don't have a way of changing the key essentially. So that's what we're going to work on now. So if we go up here to the C button we created, or C drum pad I should say, that we created earlier and we map it to the scripter note parameter, then this is what we need to do such that we can really change the key. This can be a bit of a faff, but this is really important to get right. So if we set the parameters to be like that, C, 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 and then inverted. Then we've set the C key up correctly. I've just pressed spacebar to kill the pad. So now I'm going to do the same again. I'm going to go to shimmer. Then I'm going to go to mappings. Sorry, go to mappings and then press drone scripter set the note and we'll set the note to D flat this time or C sharp or 
Oh, and um, now that's behaving a little strangely, isn't it? So this is something I've left in to really make a point of this. So you'll notice when I change back to the C sharp, it's now set range max to be A for some reason on the C sharp drum pad. And the way I found, this is just a strange thing that happens essentially. So we just have to kind of force it to be D flat again, and then it will have updated it to be D flat. So if we demonstrate it now, after resetting the state button, this is something you need to do, otherwise it won't work. So if you reset the state button, and then if we test it out, and we swap between the two keys essentially, So you can see it's working, we've got no issues, it's just those two chords we're playing out, which is exactly what we want. So this is really the core functionality at this point of the drone machine. But obviously we want to play in more than just two keys. So now we're going to replicate this. So we're going to go back to the layout mode and we're going to create a load more drum pads. So I'll save you the agony of watching me do this, but I'll just show the procedure a little more so you can kind of get a feel for what I'm doing. So I've created one for D sharp here and I'm just calling the text E sharp and now we've got them all and I've duplicated them. I've grouped them and duplicated them and I've created two rows. And I'm gonna move the background back. Sometimes main stage is a bit weird. For example, I couldn't duplicate the first row while the background was there for some reason. And if we just adjust the size a little bit of the background, maybe move the text as well. And let's just rename the text for these ones on the bottom so that we've got, you know, C through to B. And now that's the cosmetic stuff done. So we just need to update the notes essentially on these drum pads such that they correspond with the text. Otherwise, things will get really interesting. So I've just done all that and we've just jumped back into the edit mode. And now we need to repeat all the mappings I've shown you before. So I'm just working with the F key right now. And so if we go back to F, you can see it's made range max A again for some reason. So we have to just change it back and then it's actually updated. And if we repeat the procedure now for F sharp, we just make sure it's F sharp or G flat. So you probably get the idea at this point, so I won't do any more and we'll crack on. So I've just finished the job off. All the buttons are mapped as you would hope. And now it's just time to give it a bit of a test. So I'm just gonna check that we're moving up chromatically and nothing weird is happening. So D, yeah, it's sounding good. Well, maybe not good, but it's doing what it should do, at least. Now we've got E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, and so on. You might wonder why I'm bothering to show this, but I just really out of principle, when you kind of code something or do something, it's always good to try and show a way of just testing it essentially. So if we turn off state, we've turned the drone off and we've just set G as the new key. And you can see in the program, we've just pressed D, the note is now set to be D. So you can see it's really working, see, it's doing what it should. So I've just moved back to layout to add a really important button. I'd recommend still watching to the end just because there's still a few things that I think are really important to do. So this button is going to be a panic button. So what can occasionally happen in main stage is you might end up with a, a glitch where somehow you end up with notes being lat, notes being lat, notes being la notes being latched so it's really important to have a way of kind of killing all the sound so that you can kind of start at square one again and i'm just going to assign it to an action at concert level and the action is going to be panic make sure you do it at concert level as well that's really important and so when i press this it will kill all midi data and all audio so now let's just give it a go I've just pressed C on the drone generator and I've just turned it on by pressing state as we normally do. 
and I'm just playing with the envelope a little bit. So now let's change key to D and let's say we got into A and we're all of a sudden in trouble. We just hit panic and that would kill everything. So if I now press B, that's going to set a new key and then I press state and now we could start a song in B for example. So you can see how this is really useful. So one more thing we're going to add is just a little bit of cosmetics. Just add some text that says drone generator. So just type in drone generator and expand it out a bit. And yeah, all good. So now final test. Let's see how easy it is to change key with a piano, for example. I'm using musical typing, so it sounds pretty basic, but you can still hear what's going on. So now we're just in C. C sharp and it's pretty seamless and that's chromatic transition so you know probably one of the most difficult to do now we're into A so it works like a charm really part three let me tell you how to actually use MainStage in practice. So today I'm going to teach you everything I know about MainStage and CPU management. So why should you care about CPU management? I mean, it doesn't sound very exciting, does it? I mean, MainStage and software key strings are amazing, but they do have this one fundamental problem, and that's that you can ask the computer to do way more than it should do and basically end up. You don't have to do all these tips, but I'm going to be pretty comprehensive here and start right at beginner level. And by the end of the video, I'm going to show you some really advanced stuff you can do as well. So here we go. Part one, preparation. Join me on the desktop of my computer. I'm going to teach you a load of things here that you should do just before you even open the program, because there's actually a lot of things that can really derail main stage from outside the program. So come up here and turn off Wi-Fi, or just make sure the Wi-Fi is turned off. Yep, we're all good. And then turn off Bluetooth too and then put it on do not disturb so you don't get any notifications pop up on the screen while you're playing or anything of this nature. Also turn off airdrop if you've got that as well on. The other thing you wanna do then is make sure that all the programs you've got are closed apart from main stage. So a good way to do this is perhaps go to activity monitor, I think it's called, and go to memory and just see what's using a lot of memory. I mean, you can look down the bottom of the screen as well, but you can see here that Google Chrome and WhatsApp are using a fair bit. So let's close those out. I'm also going to close out Microsoft Auto Update and Activity Monitor. Looks like we're all good now. So I'm going to go back into search now, and I'm going to look for System Preferences, and I'm going to find Battery. And I'm basically going to try and make sure that Display never goes to sleep. The reason I do this is because this actually did cause me a problem once. I was once playing and the display went to sleep and my computer lost all of the MIDI connections to the keyboard and everything like that. And it was frustrating, of course. So this is just one I really like to do personally. Though actually you might find you can get away with not doing this, but it's more just a personal thing. So I'm also making sure that it's both going to do this when it's connected to the power adapter and when it's just running on the battery itself. So here's another little tip as well. Main stage can actually run in a higher res or low res mode, depending on whether you've got a Retina Mac or not. So if you go to the Applications folder and click on Get Info on the main stage application, you can press Open in Low Resolution, and this will actually use less resources, less CPU. And to be honest, you don't really notice the difference when you're playing live or when you're using the application. Also, it sounds a little bit obvious, but make sure you've got your MacBook plugged into the charger because MainStage will drain your resources a bit harder than a lot of programs. Part two, inside MainStage. So now we've done all the kind of preliminary stuff, let's hop into the application and actually do some stuff inside. So I've just opened up this really pretty basic concept with just two patches and I've hopped into the main settings. I'm gonna go into general. And I'm going to make sure that auto save modified concerts is set to never. I've got it set that way because I've used the program quite a bit, but it will normally default to every five or 10 minutes or something like this. And this is really important to have on never because you don't want MainStage trying to save itself halfway through a live performance because this will cause a CPU spike, which might cause the program to crash. Now head into the advanced settings and we're going to play with the input output buffer size settings. The bigger the number, in simple terms, the more time you give the computer to do processing, so the more latency you'll have, but the safer it is to run. 
You can also adjust the driver latency between more safety and less set latency as well in a similar manner, but make sure you've set CPU usage to maximum number of cores as if you've got a multi-core processor, you want to take advantage of this. So the next top tip is to use the CPU load history. So come up here and click on CPU. And you can see as I play that the CPU is working a little bit. I should say I'm using an M1 Mac, so the CPU is not going to have to work too hard. But on my older computer, the spikes would be a lot bigger. So if I duplicate this, you can see we've had a little CPU spike. And generally speaking, the CPU is a bit higher. Also, if I create another copy of Valhalla Shimmer, you see the CPU goes a bit more, but we're still barely working the computer at all. That was just a bit of a quick demonstration, but the buffer size settings I've just shown you are really, really unique to your particular computer. So just have a play around with them and try and find the best. I'm now going to show you another common mistake that people sometimes do, and that is to not simplify their concerts. So I've just loaded in a load of pads I made from this collection. I know, shameless plug. So I'm not going to be using all these sounds for a set, for example. So let's delete some of them. So I'm going to press Command A to select them all and then just unselect the ones I'm not going to delete, just as a demonstration. So if I press Backspace, that'll delete them all and you can see Mainstage remove, is removing them from the set list. So now I'm just left with the ones I want and Mainstage will run pretty quickly now, comparatively speaking. This is really quite important to do if you've got a bit of an older Mac. Now I'm going to talk about another top tip for saving CPU, and that is to use aliases. But before we talk about aliases, I'll talk about what happens when you just copy a patch normally. So I've just picked this sound that I quite like, and say oh, I like that sound a lot, so I want to use it. And I've just called it synth, and I've copied it, and I put it in the first patch as well. And you can see it plays fine with the ethereal pad thing we've got going on in the background. And I can copy it here as well. And I've just copied all those. I've not pasted them as an alias. And if I put an effect on any one of them, then it will be unique. So the other ones won't have received this effect. So you can see that if we go back to the first one, we don't have the delay that I've added to the one on the second patch. So that's all fine. But say I don't care about the delay and actually they can all just be the same on every song. Well, if I press, if I press option command V, then I'll paste as an alias rather than just pasting normally. And you can see this because there's a little green arrow on the top of the channel strip, which I've just highlighted. So now if I add an effect like a reverb, to this channel strip, then it will actually appear on every instance of the every alias of that channel strip, essentially. So we'll just demonstrate that in a second. So I've just turned off the mod wheel and we've got the reverb on this synth sound. And you can see if we go back to the first patch, we've got exactly the same. So they're all connected. And then we can paste again as an alias and they will be connected. And the advantage of this is it just uses less resources because it's effectively like only having one instance in terms of memory. Next tip is to use perform mode. This really optimizes main stage for performance, both visually and also in terms of CPU. So it's generally the best to try and operate in this mode, I find. The only caveat I would say is sometimes in edit mode, it's a bit easier to see if something's going wrong. But for the most part, I like to use perform mode. I'm going to head back to layout now and we're going to add a CPU meter to our concert. So I've just created a text box and surprisingly I'm going to stick the word CPU in that box. Now I'm going to create a parameter text and I'm going to put that underneath the word CPU. And this is going to be an indicator that tells us how hard the computer's working. Come down here and set text labels display to value and then we should be in business. Then we need to click on it at concert level, I should add, and we're going to map the CPU load to be the parameter. And so now when we're in perform mode playing, we have an indicator of how hard the CPU is working. This is pretty useful because it means we can diagnose if anything's going wrong. But as you can see here, we're doing pretty well because the CPU is barely trying and we're recording video as well at the same time. So things looking good. Another really useful tip is to use buses. So if you've got an effect and you want to use it lots and lots of times, 
it can be a really good idea to do this. So if we go back to the concert level and we click on the plus, then click on aux and press create on channel. Just press create, ignore that little message. And as you can see, we've created this new auxiliary bus, which we're gonna put in a reverb effect on. Let's put Valhalla Shimmer on it. And let's just make a really big reverb just so it's really noticeable when we go back to test it later. We also need to route or route the bus depending on which side of the Atlantic you're from. So let's go to here and go to bus and we'll put it through number eight, shall we? Let's also change the name as well to something that we can then quickly identify when we go back to the patch right now. So let's go to the patch, uh, just play a bit, it's working. So now go to send and put it through bus eight. And you can hear it's working. This is really, really useful thing to do because for example, if you wanted to use Valhalla and Shimmer lots and lots of times on all your patches, then every time you create an instance of it, it's going to use more CPU. Whereas if you just create one instance at constant level, then you're all good. So as an example of this, we can also put it on the pad. And we've got Shimmer on both of them now. And more Shimmer is always good. Probably, I don't know. Wow, you made it to part three. Plugins and extra tips. So this section just focuses on some of the sounds inside the main stage and their different CPU properties. And also some of the third party stuff and how you might fare with this. Whenever you open a new main stage concert, you're always faced with these reverb buses you get at the concert level. And they all use this plugin called Space Designer, which can be a bit CPU intensive. So I generally tend to try and avoid it. So the first thing I always do when I open up a new main stage concert is to delete the four buses it gives you with Space Designer on them. And I'll create my own auxiliary bus, as I showed you before, and I will just stick on it a reverb. Make sure to route it or route it first. So that's good. I've got the signal coming through. And I'm going to just put on a very basic reverb. Silver verb, mono to stereo. This is a really, really great reverb. Make sure you turn the wet all the way up to 100% and don't have any dry signal going through. This reverb I tend to find is really, really versatile. You can obtain some really good results with it. Another plugin I try to avoid using is Delay Designer. A bit like Space Designer, but for reverb, this plugin uses a bit more resources than the other delay options. This is the nature of these plugins though. The ones that are more, should we say, flexible tend to be a bit more demanding. So I tend to use stereo delay or tape delay, if possible. As far as synths go, the best but also the most intensive CPU-wise synth main stage has is Alchemy. You can achieve some really great results with this synth but many of the presets can be a bit CPU intensive on particularly older machines, as I say. So this is one I tend to try and avoid if I was designing a patch for, should we say, general use. So I'll now talk about the synths I really like to use in main stage in terms of CPU. ES2 is the kind of foundational main stage synth. It sounds pretty good. I mean, it doesn't quite compare to like Serum or Alchemy that I've just shown you, but the sound quality is pretty good and you can get some pretty versatile great sounding results with it. If you want a bit more vintage sound, then use Retro Synth. This is also really low CPU. It sounds great and I use it really regularly. Now let's talk about third party. Now this is a, such a varied topic, but I've just got Serum up here, which is a really popular third party synth, but it's also notorious for being quite high CPU in certain cases. So it's not something I'd really use with main stage too much. But as you can see, if I turn all the effects on, you start to get a bit more bit of higher CPU, shall we say. And I'm not even playing that many notes. So I guess what I'd say is, even with main stage stock stuff, you're gonna have to think a bit about what you're doing. And so the more third party stuff you throw into the mix, the more you're gonna have to be careful with CPU because these different plugins do behave quite differently. This is the stock main stage sampler. Generally speaking, sampled synths don't use a lot of CPU. They just tend to use a bit more memory. But I'm just demonstrating here, just scanning through the patches and you can see they use almost no CPU whatsoever. And they all use pretty roughly the same kind of CPU as well. As a final demonstration of the third party aspect, here's another synth from Gospel Musicians called Pure Synth Platinum 2. It's a really, really great synth, but you can see here from some of the presets, I'm getting a bit more CPU spikes. Nothing too crazy, but just 
more into the kind of 30s, 40s, nearly. And you can see it's different for different patches as well. Now I'm going to show you an advanced tip that I detail quite thoroughly in this video. If you really like a sound from Serum or Omnisphere, but you find the CPUs unmanageable, then you can always sample it using this technique. So I'm going into Utility, and I'm going to load up Auto Sampler. Now this is just a MIDI based plugin that's going to send MIDI trigger notes to the VST such that we can sample it. So first thing we need to do is just drag out the range in which we're going to sample over. So I'm just dragging the range appropriate for an 88 key keyboard. You might sometimes find for a sound you're sampling that it doesn't sound particularly good on certain parts of the keyboard. So it's generally a good idea to try and make sure you've sampled a range where it, the patch sounds quite good. But for this tutorial, I'm just going to sample the whole range. I'm going to sample every six semitones because this will be fine for this kind of synth sound. If you were using a piano, you'd probably want to turn it down to three semitones. I'm not going to take multiple samples for each key by doing a round robin. And I'm going to reduce the sustain length to about eight seconds. I'm then going to use, I think I'll just pick Penrose machine for this one. You can try the different algorithms out, but this one should be fine for this particular sound. This is just searching for where it's going to loop the samples such that they sustain out. Now all we need to do is press sample and tell the computer where we want to put our new sampler instrument. I'll just call this one demo. So let's hit sample. This normally takes a few minutes, so I've just sped things up. So now I'm going to create a new channel strip and I'm going to create a new instance of the EXS24 sampler and load in the sampler instrument. So you can hear it sounds pretty good actually. It sounds pretty close to Serum. And if you look at the light blue EXS24 in the CPU load history, you can see it's been very kind to the CPU. This is because playing back samples is not very CPU intensive compared to a modeling synth like Serum. To really prove this point, I'll now just play a load of notes. So let's try out the auto sampled version. So I know that sounded beautiful, but it was really just to prove a point that actually if you use this technique, you can use some sounds that you might not have thought possible to use live. This leads us on to our next tip. Sometimes the best CPU management is to know when you're beaten. Many songs have so many parts now that you have to make big compromises on sound quality such that you can kind of recreate all the parts live. And even then, the parts you've kind of created are a bit of a not so good imitation. So. If in doubt and you're feeling lazy and sampling's not your thing, just leave it on the track. Take the song Let Go by Hillsong Young and Free. So for this track, I'd say there's two core sounds, the piano and this polyphonic trance synth. So for the piano, I'm just using addictive keys with a tiny amount of reverb. And for the synth, I've just got this. What I'll do is I'll just use those two sounds live and remove the two stems from the track. So this is what I'm not playing, which is all the background kind of stuff. And the background stuff again. I'm all for trying to play as much live as possible, but I've also learned that it's not possible to compete with the track sometimes for certain songs. I have in the past tried to play more than what I've just demonstrated for songs like Let Go. However, this can be a little bit difficult, not just because you have to play more and think harder, but also because your audio engineer is going to have less control over the overall sound. So lots of things to think about. Before we wrap up though, last tip. This is a bit of a bonus one. So I've just gone back into layout mode and I've created a fader. And I'm going to map that fader to the volume of this electric piano. So let's just check that one out. It's all working nice. You can see the volumes going up and down. So now we're going to set up a plug-in bypass using the fader. So if we press on the plus icon here and we press map parameter, and we click on the 
like power button for the plugin essentially then this is going to result in the plugin oh, not yet we need to change the rage minimum to be bypassed so that means that when the fade is down the plugin is off and when the fade is up the plugin is on so that means that when your you know your fader is down you're not using any resources you're not using any cpu so that can be quite useful if you've got some pretty cpu intensive sounds that you only need to use at a certain point in a song so you can see when i lower it the cpu drops for the classical electric piano to zero the orange contribution on the graph also if you turn up the reverb bus send there you can see that the reverb carries on when I've turned the fader down. Thanks for watching. I hope that's been really helpful. Don't forget to follow the link in the description to download the concert. Leave any questions or queries you might have in the comments as well. And God bless and have a great day.